Hello, welcome to the last tackle on loverugbyleague.com, the ultimate home of rugby league on the web. I'm James Gordon and I'm joined as ever by Drew Derbyshire and this week we've got the incoming Rochdale Hornets chairman Andy Maisie. Andy, thanks for taking time out of your no doubt busy schedule. No, appreciate you To come us. in and see you. The first guest we've had whose surname isn't Smith, so, uh, <laughs> well, so we're making progress. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk obviously lots about Rochdale and, and things like that as well. We'll go through the usual last weekend's games. And look ahead to this weekend. I know Andy's got some Challenge Cup related drama that we might talk about later on uh, to go through. Um, let's just look back at last weekend then. Um, Warrington St. Helens, um, a big, uh, well, a bit of a statement win for Warrington, 19 0. I know the uh, the newspaper, or one of the newspapers, have already putting it on the front page for some reason. But uh, although Saints had injuries, it was a good performance by Warrington. Oh, solid performance. I- we we were speaking after the game on Thursday, James, and I just said it was a, it was a complete performance. That's exactly what what you want from a team. Steve Price, I don't think he, he'll be able to pick out too many negatives with that performance. I was impressed with Matty Ashton again at fullback, uh, whereas it, whereas his counterpart Jack Wellsby for Saints didn't have the best of games today. I think he's an experienced uh, shot through a little bit. He was a bit dodgy under the eye ball, but uh, he's an exciting prospect. He'll do well. Uh, in the future, but I was impressed with how Warrington shipped it out to the centre of Winger. Uh, I didn't think they did too much of that against Wigan the, the week before because it, obviously there was a man down from 20 minutes onwards, but uh, Anthony Gelling saw plenty of the ball and Josh Charlie uh, turned it up as well. You've set Andy up really well for talk about Matty Ashton there. Obviously, you, you know him well from from Swinton and obviously did the deal, I suppose, to, to get into Warrington. So I suppose it's no surprise to you how well he's done in them first two games. No, I mean, obviously, funny funny one that. I went for a coffee yesterday afternoon in Costa down in Lee and uh, Fitzy was in there. And I just said, Matty's going all right for He said, yeah, cracking deal, mate, cracking deal. So I think they're happy with that one. But, he, I mean, he's that type of kid who, whatever level he steps up to, he just seems to take it all in his stride and... Uh, the first two games I've watched both games, he just looks like he's been playing at Super League level all his life, doesn't he? He's just ducked to water. Yeah, and it's interesting because he might not have necessarily got the chance if Widdop had, had be had not been injured. Because you know Ratchford's being the number, you know Ratchford's obviously first choice fullback. If Widdop hasn't got injured, then you never know. He could have been waiting six months for a game. I think that's it. Yeah, he's been fortunate in that respect. He's probably got in earlier than anybody anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know they've probably got a bit of a, a nice problem to have on the, on their hands now with Widder being due back any time. I don't I don't know if you can drop the kid though. It's, it's a difficult one because the way he's playing, he seems to he's brought a new dimension to, to the whole attacking side of the the, 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 the team, hasn't it? I, I, I think I think you've got to play with it when he when he comes back. But then I, I also see a positional change for for Matty Ashton where it, I think he could push Tom Lyon for that wing spot. Uh, I think you've got to play Ratchford, you've got to play Widdup, you've got to play Austin. Uh, so I think Ratchford will move to full-back, uh, Widdup and Austin in the halves, Josh Charlie on one wing, and I think it'd be a, a race for that other wing spot between Ashton and Lyon. I think the thing with Ashton is you, you can just sort of feel it in the crowd when he gets the ball. Or I think there was a move, wasn't there, in the second half where he came off an inside ball and he just ran through a, a tackle. And then you could just hear the crowd just lift, like, you know, and there's only so many players that can do that. Yeah, yeah. I think what he does very well is he, he supports he support players fantastic. And what he did for us well last year is he got on the back of some of the middles that we had could offload. So he, he got on the back of that and uh, he just follows everything. He, he You know, he, he believes every every play that he can get on the end of something. And uh, if he gets if he gets his nose through the line, there's not many he's going to catch him. No, I must admit I was a little bit concerned about his size, but he, in the two games that he's played, that doesn't appear to have been, well, you know, an issue. When we was at the the Warrington uh, media day a couple of weeks ago, James, we were speaking to Steve Price, weren't we? And uh, he's, I think Matty Ashton has said he said he's been having five meals a day just to put on an extra couple of storm um, over the off season. Uh, and I think he has bulked up a yeah, little bit. A bit he, was, yeah. he was very, very uh, lean at Swinton. Um, but just touching on his time at Swinton, it was actually uh, the Swinton host in Toronto at home last year where he really caught my eye at fullback. I think Swinton were on the, the end of a heavy scoreline. Um, but Ashton stood out. He, he handled Toronto perfectly. Um, and for, for, for a lad who's on the smaller side, he doesn't mind getting battered, does he? He doesn't mind getting a shot on him. I think the thing with him is, he's, he, although he's sort of, uh, in, in terms of stature, he's not not filled out as yet. He's still a, still a kid, if you like, but the, the frame's there, so he's, mm. he's a good six foot two, mm. wide shoulders. And, and as soon as I obviously knew he was going to Warrington, I felt that as soon as they get him into that full-time environment and they work on him, 
potentially we talk about him moving into onto the wing and what have you, but longer term, I think he'd make a great centre because he's got he's got everything mm. that you could mm. you know, all the tools to, to go really well in the centres mm. as well. So he's they've got options with him certainly and, and, and it's a fine problem to have really because I think last year they, they went out of the traps really well, Warrington, and, yeah. and their halves were performing. But you know, when when once one dipped and Patton maybe wasn't quite you know the player they, they needed at that point, to have the options they've got now, yeah, hell of a lot stronger, are they? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, do you think? Do you feel like say obviously Saints were missing Coote, they were missing Roby, they were missing Makinson, Worms are pulled out in the warm up. Knowles. Percival, no, Knowles was missing. Percival obviously took that shoulder hit and he went off sort of early in the second half. Um, do you feel like? I, I feel like yeah the Saints are missing them players and you can't not acknowledge that but I still feel like it was a good display for Warrington regardless of, I mean they could only play who's in front of them exactly but it, it's a tough one this isn't it because if, you, if you're a Saints fan you're saying well we're missing five key first team players though um, but if you're a Warrington fan then you are saying we can only play against against what we come up against obviously Saints are nowhere near full strength uh, but I think even at full strength Warrington would have come away with the, with the two points Um it's all if buts and maybes at, at this stage, but uh, I was really impressed by by Warrington and I, I'm sure Steve Price is as well. Um, other games over the weekend, obviously only four Super League games because the games on Sunday were postponed. Um, Casford beat Wigan 16-12, which to be fair is a good result for Cas because they've got plenty of injuries as well. Um, Hull Derby, Hull were winners 25-16 against Hull Car. We just touched upon this one a little bit because it was a really good game on, on Friday. And to be fair... The two games, Thursday and Friday, were a bit like, this is what Super League should look like all the time for me. You know, they were both played in front of, you know, near capacity crowds, great atmospheres, great great games, great stories behind them. I must admit, I was very concerned when I seen the teams about all KR's pack. But then in reality, when they played, some of them players like Jez Litton, Dean Adley, players like that really step up and really, you know, play well above their weight. I think, I think that's the best time I've, I've seen Jez Lisson play in Super League. Uh, I think he really got stuck in. I think when he was at Hull FC, he was he was always in the shadow of Danny Houghton. And, it, and you, you can't really blame him for that because Danny Houghton's a cult hero at, at the club. Um, but I was really impressed with the way he played. But one player who did stand out for me for Hull KR, obviously we put a lot of emphasis here at Love Rubber League on the Super League so we don't get out to the Championship and League One as, as much as we, we'd like to. Uh, but Matty Storton uh, stood out for me uh, for Hull KR. Obviously, he, he arrived in the off season from Bradford. Um, he had a highlight, uh, standout game in week one, and, and last week he backed it up again. I thought he was outstanding. He, he's just a bit of a John Bateman type character. He just loves to get stuck in. He, he runs absolutely everywhere for his team, and he's the type of player you, you want at your club. <laughs> what about that try as well? Uh, ben Crooks's try that went through plenty of hands. Will that? That be try of the season. Do you think we'll see one better than that? It's got to be up there, hasn't it? it? I think it went through nearly every every player on in a whole car shirt. Um, it was fa- it was a fantastic try, wasn't it? It it, it will be up there uh, come the end of the and season. And I suppose it makes up for the fact that that one was given to Harvey Levet early on, where he never even got it down. <laughs> So I suppose we we give all KR two uh, for that. Let, one. Let's discuss that. Who was that even given? <laughs> Come on, like I think everyone watching on the big screen in the in the ground and everything. Um, could, and I, I think even Ava Levet probably knew inside that he didn't manage to to get the ball though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it's difficult with the video refs referring it up because sometimes it's a bit like well, they can't make a dis- they can't go against him because obviously if there's no if there's not enough evidence to overturn what he said. But then at the, I I I mean I know obviously we changed the rules so the refs would send something up. But I'm a bit I'd probably go back the other way and say mm. well that's just send it up and let them have a look at it because I mean it's not a problem you get in the championship no, no. doubt. But no. I mean imagine how many tries there are scored that get given that potentially could get turned around. But it was it was a strange one because everyone must have been looking at it thinking well yeah okay there's not enough why is there not enough evidence to overturn it because you've not seen any evidence that he's got it down. <laughs> I think I think when we uh, we just got to thank the lucky stars really that we're not talking about VR. VAR. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> I think in terms of our systems, they might not be perfect. I mean, I mean, I suppose a bit better than that. I, I, I mean, it'd have been interesting if Full Car had a one by two or something like that. We might have been hearing a little bit more about it. Um, Salford beat Toronto twenty four sixteen. Actually, Toronto um, put up a bit of a dig. It was. It was quite close. I think it was six four at half time, and then and Toronto got it back to sixteen all at one point, and then Salford scored two late on. Andy, you've uh, announced a partnership with Toronto. Just tell us a little bit at Rochdale, just tell us a little bit how that's the dynamic of that work and how it came about. 
Yeah, well, I think in terms of how it came about, they're, they're based over in uh, Hotwood Hall College, where, where, where we're obviously based. And our head coach, Matt Calland, is uh, full time there with, with the uh, obviously with the college and, and coaching the academy, the Cat 3 Academy. So it was a natural thing, really, in, in terms of us both being on the same facility. Uh, Matt and Brian McDermott, obviously, playing together at Bradford was another synergy that, that was there. And uh, I do know a couple of the guys on the sort of management administration side of Toronto, and it just made perfect sense, really, in that you know we can share resources, we can share knowledge, potentially, you know, the, we, we will get some playing, uh, playing resource. As and when Toronto can. So you're Sunny, 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 Bill, Sunny, Bill, Sunny Bill, 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 Bill and Well, we don't want to. He said they can only have him twice this year. So we're <laughs> be a bit selective when we use that one, but. Um, you know, it's, it makes perfect sense. It's uh, it's an opportunity to do something for the sport, a bit wider than a normal partnership. In in that, we can uh, we can do some meaningful community work. They've got the profile. Mm. We've got the delivery mechanisms. So. It's just uh, it's an absolute no-brainer, and, and I don't see how, how there can be any negative towards it. Could we see any of your lads playing for Toronto? That was a question we were asking. I know obviously Penkovic and uh, Sam Hopkins have played there before, haven't they? Was is that was that part of the discussion? Because obviously there's a lot of talk about Toronto haven't got enough players yeah. and stuff. Was that- that's that's not been part of the conversations. Obviously, if we do get any uh, when you partner with somebody, if we do get any lads that are showing, you know, showing uh, enough to to warrant a, a shot at Super League, we would obviously move them towards our partners but there's, there's no intention at this stage for, for Toronto to draw down off us um, unless they had a serious injury crisis and they needed to needed to borrow a player or two I don't know but that's not the intention the intention is more from that side of things a conventional dual registration whereby we will hopefully be able to get access to a few of their players who will need some game time that will obviously supplement what we've got um, and then there's the, the bigger picture in terms of community work in terms of what we can do for the, the greater good for the sport and, and get participation and people talking about rugby league in Rochdale because ultimately if we can get them engaged and interested in rugby league they're not all going to fly to Canada to watch a game are they? <laughs> yeah. so hopefully they'll come to, to uh, the Crown Oil instead do you, do you see that as a you know as a, as a critical opportunity for, for Rochdale obviously Rochdale you know with due respect to them are, are one of these sort of heartland clubs that have you know, been struggling for a few years and obviously then on the other end of the scale you've got Toronto throwing loads of money at it and yeah. and stuff. How important is it to show that there's synergy between the traditional Heartlands and the, the new kids on the block, if you like? Well, I think my view has always been over the last sort of 12, 18 months is that there's the way the sport's going, um, the strongest will sort of survive long term and, and the strongest will ultimately be the, the strong Heartlands clubs with with a real sort of engaged community people playing the sport and interested in the sport and then on the flip side of that it does look very much like the future is going to be maybe the new franchises your your, your Ottawa's your New York's your Toronto's so I think that the future will hold a combination of both so if the reason we've taken Rochdale on is we believe there's a lot of potential there and, and a lot that you can build a club around so you know all the building blocks are in place to put together and, it, and, and it's not an overnight thing obviously it's going to take a while and and, and we've got to build steadily and sustainably. Sustainable is the key word. But over the next three to five years, we believe we can get ourselves back into the championship, become a, a, a sort of strong, you know, competitive championship club. And then you start looking at your next uh, targets then, don't you? What, what's, your, what's the current understanding of what's happening outside of the championship? Because the, is, there, is there a fear? Are you driven a little bit by the fear of what's going to happen in terms of maybe getting cut off from central funding and all that? <clears throat> yeah, I think if you wind back 12 months ago when I was sat, obviously, in a, a, at a different club, in a, in a position for a different club, the fear was very much what happens beyond this TV deal and where the sport's going. Um, obviously, you know, to be able to, to, to sustain a club long term, you, you, you know, there's a heavy reliance at the moment for a lot of clubs on, on TV revenue and if that's not there there's a problem isn't there so you know the, the, the sort of move we were trying to make with the previous club was to, to future proof it to give it an opportunity to be able to ultimately you know survive and stand on its own two feet beyond a potential you know point where there wouldn't be any TV money or reduced funding um, that's obviously worst case scenario um, the difference in, in terms of Rochdale is we're very much uh, you know, we we can build a self-sustaining model within its current guys because it's in the town. Yeah. We've got a, a ready-made uh, delivery tool in the community with a, a foundation that's already active. And these are all things that, you know, with having a strong community game, we've got you know, Rochdale Mayfield. You, you talk about the game on Friday night, there's three lads out there that have come through that, that Rochdale Mayfield club. So the, 
the pipeline of players and the, and the pathway is already in place. And if we can join all that up and we can get them into the Oxford system, that gives them then a clear pathway through right through through us and, and into Super League to Toronto. So you can clearly see all the blocks are in place. It's uh, pulling them all together and building something now. It is how how much of an impact does it have on on like business planning though? Not knowing. What, or, or do you have to literally take that out of the equation and just assume you're not going to get any central funding? I think that's what we're doing at Rochdale. We, we couldn't do that at previous clubs because it was too heavily reliant upon that funding with not having any other sort of uh, revenue streams yeah. that would make that up um, without private investment. Whereas the way we're looking at this one, because of the potential, it's more investable. So you, you, you can justify the investment. The guys who've come on board, it's not, you know, it's not a one-man show at Rochdale. It's, there's five of us involved at board level. We'll all be investing pro rata, so the the percentage holding of the club, you know, will be, be divided between uh, between five investors and shareholders. And, uh, and and the feeling is that everybody wants to invest in it because of all the things we just spoke about. So to answer your question is, we don't believe that um, losing TV funding because obviously in League One now we're on the lowest yeah, funding maybe, anyway. Yeah. So. While it's not ideal and it's not what we want, if the TV funding is gone by the end of next year, we believe we can sustain the club, mm. which is a different position to where we would have been yeah. elsewhere. You know, uh, you mentioned Rochdale Mayfield as well. Obviously, you've picked up a lot of players from the the community game, the amateur game over the off season. Is mm. there a little bit? Of, is there not a concern that you're that you're draining the amateur game of players? Where does that? How does that? Because obviously, I know Mayfield got absolutely spanked by North Wales at the yeah. weekend, and is that partly because? You've taken their best players. I think there's a there there is an element of that which was happening before I have sort of got on board and the, and the new guys have come in, um, which won't be happening long term. We can't sustain a club and, and build a club along those lines. Just going cherry picking from our neighbours and from our amateur clubs, and it's very much a problem that's existed in rugby league generally, not just Rochdale. I'm I'm obviously from Lee, and historically, you know, when when Lee East have had a good side or Lee Miners and the, the pro clubs have come along and taking the best players it's a problem so we've you know that's been a short-term issue Matt obviously inherited the job last year there was problems he tried to uh, address those problems by bringing in people who he knew and he could work with and uh, you know similarly he, he didn't have any clarity until we, you know the, the deal was in place for us to take over the budget was restricted shall we say so he had to recruit from where he could get sort of uh, you know, his budget would permit, whereas since we've come in, we've been able to give him some assurances on additional spend. We've been able to, uh, you know, we've, we've not solely relied on, on the amateur game. We've gone out and we've signed the likes of Penkovic and mm. we've been able to re-sign Sean Ains, Cole, Sam Hopkins has come in. So that's the calibre of player we've tried to supplement what we believe is a but, solid squad with. But I do disagree with <coughs> all people who, who do um, say that Rochdale Hornets are taking all the players from the community game and all this because... Let's face it, the community game at open age, it's, it's lads in their early 20s and you, you can't um, say no to the fact that they're going to be earning some money from, from playing for the Hornets. So you've got to say fair play to these young lads who make the step up from the community game where, where they're just playing for a couple of beers with, with their mates after the game on a weekend to actually testing themselves, playing semi-professional rugby league uh, and earning a little bit of extra money. I mean, I mean in some ways, you could just say it's the pathway. You know, you could just say, well, that, ultimately, that's the pathway, you know, and, and obviously you look at... You know, you look at Matty Aston as your perfect example. Is someone who was plucked out of playing community, and now he's playing Super League. And if you asked every community rugby league player if they wanted to play Super League, then the chances are they probably would. But then, if you put some sort of clause on it, then it's <laughs> it's not fair on on those lads in the community game who would like to make that step up to League One or to or to yeah. Championship. I it, think it you've got, be fair you've, on got you've got to do things the right way, in my view, and, and we've got to go back to the start and start again in respect of the Mayfield um, link is, is we can't go there and, and cherry pick four or five players at any given time. We've got to work with, with Mayfield. It's got to be a two-way street. Um, they've got to want to work with us because, you know, let's be honest, if they've been used and abused over the years, we've got to build some trust and we've mm-hmm. got to go, go there and, and, and open, the, open that relationship back up. And, and, and longer term, you know, what we'd like to think is if they're developing, you know, they've got a good uh, prospect coming through, that because of the way we're taking the club and we're building the club, that, that prospect will want to come to Rochdale. So it'll be a natural thing rather than us having to go and, and steal somebody. But, but <clears> that you can you can look at Super League, for example. Ian Watson, the Salford coach, made a comment last year about all the best players at Salford being cherry-picked every year because 
their budget isn't as big as a Wigan or a That's just a theme chain isn't it? Exactly, exactly, yeah. But it's exactly the same with Rochdale Onyx in the community game. If you look at it, not Rochdale Onyx, just look at it as a League One club. I think, I think there's a, a League One club taking a player or signing a player from uh, an amateur club in the NCL. Uh, it's just the same as a, a, super, a top Super League side signing someone from uh, a lower half Super League side. There's a knock-on effect, I believe, as well this year in terms of the reserves coming back at Super mm. League uh, level. There's been a, a drain on, on championship players because they're having to pad out squads. So have, you, have you found it harder to, to recruit because of the Super League reserves I, I think, this year? Yeah, definitely. There's a number of players that I believe would have been available who are, who are on part-time contracts with Super League clubs purely to play mm. play reserve team rugby, which that's affecting the, the player pool in the championship. That goes down to, you know, they, they go and recruit from League One and consequently League One have to go and recruit from the community game. Well, I mean, I suppose you look at, obviously, Witness as an example. Witness have gone part-time. You look at the players Witness have had to sign because you would imagine that players that maybe Witness could have got in the past are staying at Warrington or saying to play in reserves. Well, so we, Witness did, yeah. I mean, even Witness have got reserves. So Witness have got players playing for their reserves that might have typically have ended up playing for, say, Goxdale or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, like we, we, we've we seen Carl Shelford who obviously used yeah. to play at, at Rochdale he's gone to, to Warrington Reserves for this year and there'll be quite a, a couple of players like that as you, as you I, mentioned I, that and I, I see would rather play in Super League Reserves than yeah in there's, there's a lot of sense in it as well because somebody like Kyle um, you know he's, he's, he's a, a true professional Every, I've, I've obviously seen him play at, he's a at great Swinton. lad isn't he? he's a great lad fantastic professional um, and he's everything that you want young kids around in terms of development and learning because you know, the lonely, the young lads will only learn the right, the right things and do the right things on the back of playing with Kyle. So that that makes perfect sense, but it, it can't be denied that that's having a knock on effect on you. elsewhere. You know. What about you? Yeah. There's a dual reg now, isn't there, between League One and Community, yeah. so you can do a bit of dual reg. So in some ways, could you argue that we're dragging the player pool up because ultimately? You know, obviously, Super League are taking more players out of Championship, but then Championship take more players out of Amateur, and the hope is that the Amateur clubs are then going to find some new players. Is that a good way of looking at it? I think that's exactly what's happening at the moment, you know, and, and I think the problem is, is, is it's like anything where there's a food chain. When you get to the bottom of that chain, there's a problem, isn't there? Because yeah. that's where everything's been, you know, the fat's been eaten away, hasn't it? Um, certainly, you know, you can see by going to some of the community clubs that I have relationships with. Where once upon a time they were operating a first team, second team, and even in some cases a third team in a masters and, and an 18s. So there's a lot of players across there. The majority are now are, are, are operating first teams. Some of the bigger clubs have still got second teams. But after that, they're really struggling for numbers, mm. even at, especially at sort of uh, the 17 year olds and the, the under 18s. They're really struggling. So there is a, there's been a, a real uh, sort of drain on, on, on the community game I think just on, on the 17 18 year olds do you think the the scholarship system the scholarship s- scheme has had an effect on that because I I find sometimes if a player say a player's at, at Wigan um, and he, he comes through the, the scholarship system but then when he's, he turns 16 17 they'll, they'll say he's not good enough anymore that's him done then because yeah. No offence to, to the community clubs, but he's worn the Wigan track, so he's got all the Wigan gear and everything <clears> like that, and he'll say, well, I've, I've just been playing for Wigan. Yeah. And why, why would I go back to playing for Leeds, they can, for example? They, they, it can be, uh, and I've seen it, in, in that the, there can be a little bit of embarrassment there in that they, you know, they've they've been put up on a pedestal and we've, they've signed for Wigan and, and they're up there. and all They've been sudden, sold the dream. Yeah, and they, they, and they come back out the, the back door, if you like, and... And the, the options are either, you know, they can try and find a League One or a Championship club or go back and play with the mates at community level. And uh, and I think some lads will, will do that without a problem and not think twice about it. But others, I, I definitely think that's that can be an issue where they think that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll be seen to not be the player that everybody thought I was because I'm having to go back, stick, take a step back. But if you look at, you know, there's, there's lads that have not gone through them scholarships and, and, and into the... The, into the, uh, the the Super League uh, structures what have made it in the game and Matty being a mm-hmm. we've just spoken about Matty Matty I think he had a brief spell with Salford but he's come through the old fashioned route of uh, the good old community game and into into the sort of lower league and then he's progressed to Super well, League Alex Wormsley only got, I think he got picked up by Batley on a trial basis when he yeah. was 22 yeah, he was playing for Jewsbury Celtic he was, mm-hmm. he was playing for Jewsbury Celtic and then he was playing like university rugby for Leeds Beckett I think it was well, you, you had Chris Atkin didn't you <clears throat> at, at Swinton was a, yeah. was another one where he was in, he was at witness he'd got to 19 and he was cut because 
when the under nineteens he was too yeah. old to keep yeah. him and then he just he's one of those that just carried on playing and then got picked up. But you know, you imagine for every one of him there could be any number of players who are just saying, oh, I'm not gonna play anymore. There's a lot of kids who who, who fall out of the game. Um and sadly are lost to the game, aren't they? I mean, we're not returning uh, as many players. I, th- I think the, the the issue with the numbers not being there at 18s, like they used to be, the, a lot of lads are, it's a critical age, 16, 17, because mm. they, they start finding other things other than rugby to do over a weekend, don't mm. they? And, uh, so that's an age where there needs to be a massive emphasis and focus on really in driving numbers, because... You know, if you go to a lot of the successful amateur clubs, they they've got two or three teams at some age groups. Mm. But as the as the age groups progress, you see the numbers dwindle, and that's telling us something. In that, you know, we can engage them as youngsters and and babies and, and minis and juniors. But as they're progressing age wise, they're falling out of love with the game or f- moving away from the game. So to me, that tells us we've got to look at that and the reasons why and maybe, you know, why are they why are they why are they dropping off? Why how can we address that? How can we keep them engaged and, and maybe the the systems above are, are not helping and, and there might be a, a way of tweaking things and working working with a stronger a stronger emphasis on community game working with the pro game to make sure that we're not losing players so there's got to be a mechanism for those lads who feel like you know they're at the community club needs to be able to get the arm around them and say you know but yeah, even, almost even, like a parachute yeah, to yeah, catch yeah, them but they... even once slightly older as well obviously the system's changed for, for this year but uh, if you look at the the under nineteen system, because because there wasn't reserves last year, you had you had lads who, who <coughs> finished the three years with the St Helens, um, but they don't get signed to first team contracts, and then they're like nineteen, and they're like, well, I've been playing for St Helens under nineteen, I'm not going to play for a community club, um, mm. and then they'll they'll just finish <coughs> playing all together, um, I mean, and we, that happens that happens quite regularly. Yeah, I mean, if if you're smart. And, and, and we've had success at, and going back to even when I was involved at Lee we had uh, Paul Anderson who was coaching the reserve team at the time at Lee had some good links at St Helens and we had a lot of talent who were dropping out without those structures mm. and uh, the names I can you know they come and we just signed one of the lads there Jamie Tracy um, but there was a lot of lads who, who Chris Ankinson you know, as well well An- Ankinson was one who came out the Salford system and we, mm. we brought in um, Joe Bullock similarly came from Wigan uh, this the the lads who've come in back in the pro game and then move back to community. I'm just thinking Lewis Foster, yeah. Thato Heath, and players of that ilk really. Who, if you're smart, you can look at what's coming out of the the, the Super League clubs and and really be successful in uh, in picking up some some talented players. Yeah. You did well there, uh, Andy. Not to reveal what you did at weekends when you were eighteen. I quite like that. <laughs> um, championship games over the weekend. There was only four. There was wins for Lee to lose, London and Widnes. All four of those teams have won two out of two. Um, the other games were postponed. Um, there was a couple in Challenge Cup over the weekend. Yours wasn't one, Andy, against York Acorn. You were playing. It got called off because of Storm Kara Kira. How would how they pronounce it? I don't know. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. Um, I don't from, know. <laughs> <laughs> so our understanding is that the games, I mean, it's not been confirmed yet, but the understanding is that they're going to get all the postponed Challenge Cup games played next weekend. Yeah, that's the... Um... I read that word on, on the street. I, I read that on our league last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, obviously we fell victim to the weather. We weren't the only ones. Um, learning from things that had happened last year, uh, our CEO made sure the polls were up. <laughs> so yeah. we did have the polls up <laughs> yesterday. But yeah, to be fair, we did well to keep them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was one of those days yesterday, wasn't it? Where the sport as a whole fell victim to to extraordinary weather yeah. conditions. But I think. Disappointingly, as I say, you know, it seems now that, you know, the league league one fixtures are few and far between anyway, and because of that p- postponement yesterday, it's looking like that we're we're going to be made to um, obviously play next weekend. Mm-hmm. As a knock on effect, we're going to lose our first league one fixture. The way the fixtures play out is it's a Challenge Cup weekend the weekend after, and then we get a bye. Well, unfortunately, we get a bye, so we could now ultimately be playing our first uh, league game of the season on the 8th of March mm. which you know it's not great is it well I suppose from your point of view is well I mean you were away this week anyway so I guess you wouldn't have brought in a lot of money from playing the league game this week anyway no. um, but obviously it must be hard to keep the players motivated in some ways it's not a financial issue we've, as I said the way we're structured at, at Rochdale you know financial concerns are not it's, it's not a commercial decision as you mm. say we're, we're playing your cake on 
we would have been struggling to break even yesterday anyway, yeah. so it wasn't a financial implication. Um, the problem we've got is Matt's ready, uh, the, the, the squad and the group ready for, for, for action. Um, and, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of, of all our pre-season and the last few weeks and the camps that we've done was always building towards that first game in Coventry to try and get off to a, a good, solid start. And then, uh, you know, we that was always the intention. Is we focus has been on getting, you know, getting getting that first league game under the belt and, and kicking on then. And that, through no fault of anybody's, the weather, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. out of everybody's hands. But that, that now, everything we've built towards is, uh, has gone out the window a little bit. But... We're still confident. I'm hopeful that we've. Um, I would. I would see. Always got some uh, dialogue going on today, and I'm hopeful that the, a bit of common sense can prevail because there's no with, with the weather as it is this week. There's no guarantee we can get the game on anyway. On mm. you know the the pitch was in a, a terrible state yesterday, so the common sense thing in my mind was for, was for us to, or for, hopefully we can go to Coventry, play our first game on Sunday. Rearrange the Challenge Cup game for next Wednesday, and then we play the cup game again the week. You know, yeah, so you we, we have to back up, but ultimately we can get the, you know, yeah. the common sense approach there, isn't it? Um, obviously Coventry. Have you been to Coventry before? <clears throat> I've, not, I've not. No. I mean, it must be very difficult for clubs like Coventry. We talk about player pool and, and stuff like that, and obviously you'd really like to see a club like Coventry do well, but it must be really hard for them. We talk about you know you guys attracting players. It must be really hard for them to attract players of a sufficient calibre to play in the competition yeah I think it's you know again they're, they're looking at things long term aren't they and they're developing and, and they're doing a great job Alan over there he's uh, he's doing his, his best with, with what he can do down there and um, I think what we're talking I'm talking purely from our perspective but I also sympathise with Alan because they'll be building towards that's a big game for him he's, he's yeah, opening fixture yeah. yeah. you know he'll have, he'll have no doubt no doubt sold uh, match sponsorships he'll have sold his corporate hospitality He'll be expecting a, a good crowd. Um, you know, our guys will travel. Um, again, it's it's just a, it's sort of a, a kick in the teeth, really, for the, for those lads as well, isn't it? So, mm. yeah, it's it's not ideal. Hopefully, so, as I say, I'm hoping common sense might be able to prevail. We've, you know, we've got an we've got an option. We can we can present a a, a viable way around the situation. So. You'd like to think that people will look at that and take it on merit, wouldn't you? Yeah. Could be worse, I suppose. You could have Ottawa away. Be <laughs> <in> some uncertainty <laughs> about that. That's it. I thought, yeah, I mean, there's um, when we talk about that potentially next year, we could be looking. Uh, my missus is going to divorce me. I'm, I'm going to be in New York one weekend. Ottawa weekend. <laughs> 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 that sounds like the sort of way. I bet she won't be at Barrow away, but I bet she'll be right up That's for New it, York yeah. away. I'm going to struggle to convince her West Wales is. Uh, <laughs> Unless it's middle of summer and we can find a beach somewhere, yeah. Do you, I mean, why, what, what's your... I mean, obviously, you're very pro that side of things. You're, I presume you're excited to see them come in. You know, It's not being completely confirmed yet, but... My, my view on it is that, as, as we spoke about earlier, I think we've got to find a balance. So we can't just say, out oh, with the old and in with the new. We've got to get the balance right, haven't we? And and, and I think the, the, the intention with the R, RFL's ROI model that was introduced last year... Is very much to to get clubs working to self sustain and add value to the game and the sport, yeah. and I think the ones that do that and buy into it ultimately will, you know, hopefully become sustainable and have a bright future. And and on the flip side of that, you'll have a strong pool of clubs, and hopefully these these clubs that are willing to come in and you know let's be right, you know, David Argyle's brought Toronto into the into the UK competitions and he started at the bottom, yeah. they've worked their way through, he's self funded that process. And, you know, the amount of PR and publicity that's been generated mm. by that, at no cost to us, at no mm. cost to any of us, you know, even at the Super League table now, they're not drawing off the funding. Mm. I just think that the more people that are willing to do that for our sport, the more people that are willing to back it with, with, with hard cash, I don't think we should be uh, looking at that negatively. Do you, think, do you think there's an argument to say that they should skip maybe League One and Championship and go straight to the Super League? I see the com- the sense in that, but obviously if you put yourself in a League One club's position, um, all those who are saying that they should do that, the League One clubs would argue, well, why should they Why should they bypass us? So, well, because I suppose Newcastle would say, well, hang on, we're, you know, yeah, we, we're we, just we, as we, ambitious as yeah, them clubs yeah. we want to go and Newcastle's a great example of uh, you know the work they're doing up there for the sport and mm-hmm. the interest that they're generating in, in, in an area that, you know, it's... It, Obviously, it's not not previously been a rugby league uh, hotbed, but it's untapped, and, and and clearly the amount of community clubs that are, 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 are being generated and the interest, and 
you know the the, the build that they're ongoing with is you, I think I think it's fantastic and, and, uh, and long there's may actually, continue. Yeah, there's actually Newcastle Academy players who are, who are representing England Academy uh, <laughs> now and England youth as well. So uh, I think there's very promising signs for for right. Newcastle and and. The stadium at Kingston Park, it's a fantastic, it's fantastic. facility. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant ground if you if you get the chance to, to go to it. Uh, they've got everything there. They've got all everything. I must admit, I was. I mean, I, I went up there years and years ago when it was just the rugby union. I think what struck me when I've been since is that the rugby league have given have been given like equal standing to the rugby union. Yeah. So you know, like you go and there's a sign that says Newcastle Falcons and there's a sign that's Newcastle Thunder and it's exactly the same it's not like you go to some places where it's like someone's a like you, AJ Bell and it's more sale than sale he, he, yeah, and it, yeah you know and I think that's the thing that struck me about that Newcastle setup was that think, there wasn't any sort of we're better than you we're bigger than you because ultimately the Falcons are bigger than Thunder at the moment but there was none of, you wouldn't have been able to tell that from being think, at the ground I think, I think the ownership's key in, in that the, 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 my understanding is the same uh, owner he owns mm. both clubs mm. the same chief exec yeah so there's you know, same media person and yeah so like they're on the same page there's, there's you know it's a joined up operation the thing Thinking, the thinking about the bigger picture and, 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 and rugby generally rather than just rugby league, rugby union. And I think the more of that that happened, you know, I know there was a breakaway and we're all enemies and things, but the more that we, we work together as sports uh, in the future, that, that can be beneficial. Certainly in areas where rugby league's not a hotbed, you know, where they've got a, a foothold in, in, in Newcastle and in the North East. Mm. And that can, that, there's absolutely no doubt that, you know, the gate said, rebrand if you like to, to Newcastle and then obviously the ownership and the model that they've got there that, that is driving participation for rugby league and, and the more that we can do that in, in, in untapped areas and areas where we're not not going to stronghold then we're going to grow the game aren't we is there a concern I mean Toronto are quite big on this aren't they they're quite big on rugby you know they just want kids with a rugby ball doesn't matter whether it's rugby union rugby league whatever but is there a concern that at some point it'll get to the stage where rugby union will just flex the muscles and because they've got the most money and the most commercial attraction that they'll start pinching the success that rugby league's maybe created for itself well I think that's where you ultimately the uh, the driver is super league isn't it because that's where the power is that's where the money comes into from Sky and from the TV broadcasters so by restricting people um, like David Argyle, if, if you restrict him from coming in and others like him, we're actually weakening ourselves as a sport because David is of the ilk where he can come in and challenge rugby union clubs for a player. Yeah. Simon Moran at Warrington can do the same. Let's let these guys get on with it because you know the, the Manchester United and, and the Liverpools and the big, the big brands in football are brands and, and big global names for a reason. They're powerful, they've won things, they're dominant, you yeah. know, and we've, we've got to have that degree of dominance in clubs. I understand salary cap regulations and evening the playing field so that we get competitive games. And we don't want a situation where Wigan, in the 80s and 90s, won everything. But I don't think we'd have that now because I think there's, we're a full-time pro sport. There is more than one powerful club, you know. Yeah. You, and I don't think you'd get that situation. So, so would you scrap the cap? I wouldn't scrap it. I think I'd, I'd, I'd look at ways of, of, of how we can manage it better in, in terms of if the guys that we're talking about, your Simon Morans, your, your David O'Giles of the world, they want to spend the money, they're going to do that at no risk to the club, they're willing to, to put the, you know, the adequate mechanism in place to say, I'm willing to bankroll that, that will not come back and, and bite the club, that's me spending it because I want to spend it, let them get on with it. Mm -hmm. what, I mean, what's the risk? What's yeah. the damage? I, I mean, it's funny because you say about, obviously Wigan dominated late 80s, 90s, but if you look back at that era for rugby league, I mean, obviously, I'm probably too young to remember it, but it it looks like that was a great era for rugby league. You, you know, you had test matches at Wembley in front of a full house. You know, obviously, you had you had the Australia tours and stuff. And you know, I I see videos and things from that time. And yeah, okay, Wigan were apparently winning everything, but it still felt like that was a good year. I mean, you may remember it differently, but but it's like is. Did did rugby league get too caught up on Wigan winning any, everything? Was it not more a case of well, it's not Wigan's fault that they're winning everything. It's up to somebody else to come. You know, it's it's up Toronto. to a, yeah, yeah. it's up to a Toronto well, to come in. at the time. I think it, even going back to Witness, Witness rivaled them, didn't they? they won yeah. <coughs> they won championships. It regularly got to Wembley. Um, Leeds, I remember Leeds at the turn of the uh, the nineties when Wigan were the only full time team. Leeds took the, the step themselves and they, they brought the, the Anleys and the Gregories over the Bobby Yuldins. 
So I think when you when you do take the shackles off to some degree, and and one one club makes a move and goes out to rugby union and signs a Sonny Will Billy, sorry, Bill Williams, yeah, I think then you you you'd probably provoke others to do the same. So. You know, it's a very sort of, uh, it can be an egotistical sport mm. at times. And, and when somebody says, well, there's a million quid and I'm willing to do X, Y, and Z, another guy might. Yeah. And, and ultimately, I think the profile of the sport benefits from that. Now, yeah. I think, you know, I, I can't see how we're uh, restricting ourselves and, and making it easy for the NRL to come and take a players and making it easy for rugby union to take a players. I can't see how that's benefiting us as a sport at the moment. Yeah, because you, you basically just get dragged down to the lowest common denominator, <coughs> don't you, at the moment? Yep. And, and obviously, and it is that part of the issue with the way Super League's structured? Because obviously you've got clubs in there that are obviously protecting their own interests rather than the game as a whole. Because <coughs> it's a bit like Turkey's vote for Christmas sometimes. <coughs> that's the problem as well, yeah. And I think when you've got that scenario, obviously, and uh, two or three clubs might become friendly and, and, and have the same aspirations and ambitions and... Ultimately, there's only so many votes, and if you start getting to a situation where three or four people are on the same page and mm-hmm. voting for the same thing, it becomes difficult, really, for the you know something that may well be beneficial for the good of the whole sport to get through because of people voting for their own uh, their own situation. Yeah, because I mean, if you if you look at, I think it was if you look over fifteen years, the only change really in the Super League who's got the power in terms of who's <clears> voting is that ultimately Toronto are in there now and yeah. London aren't. Yeah. And, and, and that's ultimately the only real change to the to the to the makeup yeah. of, of the league. You know, it's been the same teams, you know, there's four, not been four teams who, who have won the Super League Grand Final and that's with the salary cap. Is it is it any different to, to what it was without the salary cap? There's only and one of them teams at Bradford who were obviously not even in the in the competition anymore and, 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 who Lee, had and to be fair, struggles in the past. And to be fair, don't forget the grand final was Leeds Saints for like five years yeah, or you know, something as well. So you know it it, it is a it is a it, are we always trying to find a perfect solution? Do you think that's because obviously it always feels like you know, you ever get something, everyone overthinks it, and it's like we're trying to make. You know, to... it's like something's got to change every single year, whether whether that be structure or the cap, um, yeah, I think or the structure of the championship. I think we look at other sports and, 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 and we try and play catch up, and and and, and obviously feel that making changes and and doing what we do at times is is going to be the answer. When sometimes you've got to just think, well. You know, it's a long t- again. It goes back to club level. It's long term. We're coming in. It's going to take five to ten years to yeah, to yeah. compete with rugby union or to get back on the a level playing field with NRL and put some put some sort of roots and systems in that will you know they might they might not work right now and mm. you've we'll got to, you've got to stick. I mean, with it, the thing I always think is like if you look at football and even rugby union to a degree, it's not changed. You know, obviously they brought the Premier League in or whatever in the, in the early nineties, but. <clears throat> The structure of football doesn't change. You know, they have promotion relegation. They have the leagues. They have the leagues building up, and it's just simple. There's no that side of things is as simple as it could possibly be. So yeah. then the focus then goes on technology or improving the product or marketing or commercials. And obviously you can mm-hmm. see, and and do we? I I think I tweeted last week saying it's like rugby league wants the perfect players playing in perfect stadiums with <laughs> perfect sponsors because that's it. You know, we got loads of coverage off Israel for that, but then everyone's moaning because we're getting coverage about it. Then you get sponsors in, and like, oh, we don't want mushy peas because it, yeah. it, it's. I think we forget what our USP is at times, don't we? We forget what ultimately the product we've got. And, and you talk about the two games at the weekend. To me, forget what rugby football are doing, forget what rugby union are doing, and let's focus on our yeah. unique selling point, which is that product on the field is better than football, it's mm-hmm. better than rugby union. And I, Just I, sell that. Just sell that. And, I, and, I, everybody's doing. and the thing is, I've always said this, it's like, it doesn't matter that it's St. Helens Warrington, does it? It doesn't, really, it doesn't matter mm. where they're from, no. really. Because that product on the pitch, whether it's St. Helens Warrington or whether it's Toronto, London or whatever, that product is what it is. Mm. I, I always make the, I always say this about NFL, and obviously people's knowledge of America might be far better than what I'm, I, I'm saying, but... People watch NFL. I don't think they've got half a clue where half of them teams are from, or where you know where you you could say where's Jacksonville on a map, and half the people watching it who are mad for NFL on a Sunday won't be able to point it yeah. out on a map. I think that definitely there's a there's a, there's a case to argue that we we too hung up on what other sports are doing at times, mm. and, and we forget what what a great product mm. we've got. And for me, I think uh, you know we've got a we've got, you know ultimately we, we're everybody's investing in in their own clubs, but I think there's got to be a a, a review in terms of looking at how we how we make that product better. So, you know, 
getting that amateur we've spoken about the amateur the, the community side of it how do we get more players coming through how do we how do we make the athletes better how do we you know how do we be a, the, the end goal is super league but how do we create a proper pathway that's working properly you know do you think there should be a relationship between do you think there should be a proper pyramid so like obviously the NCL there's a bit of a glass ceiling so that way you <coughs> could win the NCL every year and never progress they might not want to progress but do you feel like that's a bit of an issue where there's not a pyramid as such like there is in football? I, I, I'd, I'd argue a case to, to the, the NCL, certainly the top NCL sides, w- would be more than competitive in League One. Well, we, we, we've seen that in the Challenge yeah. Cup on the weekend. We were speaking about it off before we came. Me, me and you, Andy, we, we, we both knew that Underbank could turn West yep. Wales over. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and West Wales are obviously the whipping boys of League One uh, over the last couple of years. Well, we, we've got we've we've pulled your cake on out the hat and uh, there's absolutely no taking that, that mm. game for granted and we know that, it, that, that that those top NCL sides can come and turn anybody over. Lee Miners over the last few years they've had some really good runs in the Challenge Cup where they've turned over the, the sides like Coventry's and I Oxford's think, and uh, well, Doncaster only beat 4-0 24-20 <clears throat> like on yeah. Saturday. That was a late but, comeback. I think 4-0 yeah, were, were winning, were There's it? definitely a lot of... Uh, the, like, say... The, I mean, that, There's yeah, not much there's, of a difference, is it? Between like, like, yeah. yeah, obviously, obviously we're close friends with Dave Parkinson. Dave Parkinson loves the, the amateur scene, so he knows a lot, a lot of the community players. Um, and it, he's he's adamant that there's a lot of players in that NCL who are, who are more than capable of playing uh, League One and Championship, but they just don't. Sometimes they don't really fancy it, and they just like to they just have it as a hobby and play. Which with is fine. Which is fine. But I just feel like because there's a there's there's a there's a, a real cut off between Super League yeah. Championship League One and NCL. I just think it gets ignored so much. Whereas in football. You know, conference, national league, whatever, doesn't get ignored because ultimately it's just the next step down. Whereas it almost feels like the NCL is a completely different yeah. competition, yeah. so it gets ignored. It's not part of the same. I think there's a yeah. I mean, you've got the NCL, and then you go um, obviously to the the Northwest Men's League as yeah, well. So yeah. there's a there's a bit of a split there as well. Where you know, I think I think you're right. It would take some thinking about and working on. But for for me, I'd like to see that whereby that NCL Premier. You get you're given the opportunity yeah, to progress, and they don't know. have to. But no, you don't. Have to. But at least open but, it up. Well, you, you, there's obviously criteria and there's minimum standards, so there'll be teams in there that can fulfil that quite criteria quite easily. And, and let's be honest, they'll put some of the League One clubs to shame, but there will be clubs who won't be able to do that. So it's got to be criteria based and, and minimum standards. But ultimately, if that's a weath, for argument's sake, or or you know Thornhill or whoever it may be, Siddle wanted a crack at that next step. And they tick the boxes in terms of criteria. Why not let them have a go? Yeah, I mean, so it's all about it boils down to finance. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, I mean, one of the other issues is one of the other issues that I perceive there to be is the whole regionalised situation. So obviously, League One, there's lots, there's teams from all over, isn't there? There's West Wales, there's North <coughs> Wales, yeah. there's London, you know, Coventry, whatever, Newcastle. In an ideal world, you'd have. A south and a north, I suppose, in mm. League One. But, but, yeah, but yeah. the issue I suppose you've got is that, not by any fault of their own, the Southern League is always going to be weaker. And mm. is the argument that the only way the Southern teams are going to get stronger is by playing the Heartlands teams? <laughs> I think that was always the argument, is, is that over a period of time, and uh, with the influence of maybe a few Australians coming in, and, and obviously lads coming down from Yorkshire and Lancashire, that you could hopefully... Uh, Start developing players in those areas, but it, it's a it's a long it's it's a long term project that isn't it, and it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you, uh, London. A lot of people will turn around and say, "Well, London's been a failure." I don't believe it has. No. If you look at the amount of London mm. lads that are playing the game now, and and partaking in the sport, you know, that can't be deemed a failure by and, any means, can it? And the bottom line is, is they got the the. I I'd love to move away from the fact that where you're judging people like that. So what if they just they they it exist? Matter, it? Does it doesn't matter as long as they're playing and get you know as long as they're just playing at rugby league every Sunday or whatever it is. That's what it's all about. The key objectives at the RFL are more people playing the sport, watching the sport, and partaking. You know, participating in it. So the more clubs, the yeah. more the more youngsters that are playing the game. He's he's only going to drive those objectives. I, I, I'm a massive <laughs> believer in that. Is like it doesn't matter that. It doesn't matter if nothing comes out of that game between Batley and Dewsbury or whatever, or Batley and Hemel Stags or whatever. The, the, the thing is, is that there's a game every Sunday and yeah. they're playing. Because like, I, I think we said last week on the show, there was 13 games in rugby league in the whole world last weekend. 
professional rugby league and it's like well you just want to increase those numbers if you look at it from a development perspective is is you might have a, a couple of lads who are playing down at, at coventry somewhere now who, who will get the opportunity to play against league one clubs the league club league one club may well look to recruit those mm. players for the the season after and they might get the opportunity then to impress championship mm. or even super league so we're looking at it from a development perspective you know there's there is a pathway there for lads to come into some of the non heartland areas start playing rugby league come through the junior side side of it and they'll get opportunities yeah, to progress then won't they but they won't get that by if nobody's seen them <coughs> play they don't yeah, get the opportunity to play against them they'll never get spotted mm. will they well <laughs> fingers crossed to get it all sorted um looking ahead <laughs> to this weekend super league um thursday night game is wigan toronto drew we're making predictions yeah uh well, don't do a score because it goes forever because you take okay. too long to think. <laughs> oh, Just yeah. Go, Wigan, well, Wigan, Wigan, this Wigan this week. Andy, what do you reckon? I, I think, and I'll keep it brief, I think Toronto, the start against Castleford wasn't as bad as everybody thought it was. I think they built on, on that. Yeah, against Salford, yeah. Against Salford. I think Wigan will win, but I think I'd expect another improved performance from Toronto. I think it's going to get a tear time for Toronto to, to bed in, really. Yeah. Would it be a disaster? Because, because if, if you looked, like, players like... Liam Kay um, and Adam Sinlow, they were at the they were at the club in League One, weren't they? So yeah, they yeah. they've, they've <clears> been they've got to get used to playing yeah. elite Super League level again. So I think it's going to take it might, it might even take one or two months. To, we, to, to, I mean, to on the subject of Toronto, perform. At what point in the season do people start talking about it being a disaster if they get relegated, or is it a disaster if they get relegated? When Sonny Builder closes, he wants to play for Rochdale. <laughs> 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 My belief is is uh, obviously once they get out to Toronto and they've got yeah, uh, yeah, some yeah. fixtures over there, I think they'll have advantages in that clubs will have to travel. I think they'll pick up enough points mm. during them that, that period to, to be able to stay in the competition. So I don't see them being relegated. I, I predicted them to finish seventh. So I predicted uh, them to finish just above OKR at the the bottom. It, but it, but, 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 but OKR is surprised. But again, it, it, but but let's just say hypothetically, Toronto would were. were going to finish bottom or we're in that fight for relegation uh, would we call it a disaster if they went down is that and then does that then open the question well why have relegation if it's going to be a disaster if one team goes I, I, down I don't think it'd be a disaster if they went down as long as, long as obviously as long as David Argyle and, <laughs> yeah. and the backers actually stuck with the, the Wolfpack I think a big issue for, for the Wolfpack is the size of the squad they've got they've got 23 players Chase Stanley set to arrive this week uh, which but he's a, in them twenty three though. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah. Which which will be a boost for them though. Um, but I think they've handled the salary cap wrong in the way they've got about the the recruitment and retention over the years. So if, if you look back to was it twenty seventeen the, the first season in League One, uh, they were signing all these Super League and Championship players who, who were on full time wages. They were offering them so much money at the time to drop down to League One. So the, them Championship and Super League players who went there at the time are, are commanding big salaries to drop down to League One. So they've signed them on two, three, four-year deals. Uh, and and that's what's taken... No, the and they, it's, they, not, it's not Sonny Bill being on five million a year no, because no. none of that... Well, <laughs> well yeah, but then you could argue that the one... The you could argue that the 175 that they're spending on the cap on Sonny Bill, they could have signed three players for... Yeah, but that's I, the argument you could I, have. I bet there's... A, much uh, less profile players at Toronto were on uh, yeah. Well, well, I mean, I suppose the argument is they were up, they were up at the salary cap in Championship, and it was like, well, obviously they had to improve well, this, this, this squad to compete at Super League. But, but this is what I'm saying: is at League One when they're recruiting these players, with no disrespect to League One, at that moment in time, it wasn't as competitive as it is now. So. Uh, in 2017, what in my opinion, what they should have done is signed maybe 10 full-time players, then the rest bring Canadian players through. Uh, I don't, obviously, the, the the whole system... Choose you to get some nasty tweets. No, no the whole the whole system about um, oh, the, the, the quarter rule that's saying that Canadian players... Yeah, that's, that's all clashes wrong, overseas, yeah. that, That's all wrong. Um, but I just think... But I think like the likes of Ottawa and New York could learn from Toronto in this yeah. experience and not splash the cash too early uh, and be a little bit more sensible but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a disaster if they go down I think you're right in the, 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 the prototype for, for the transatlantic mm. clubs and mm. the, the foreign clubs so the, a lot of the things that the experiences they've picked up over the last few years and, learnt, and you know the sharing yeah. Martin I've sat in meetings where Martin's been quite open about 
you know, a willingness to, to, to sit down with, with other clubs and, and share that knowledge. Because yeah. it's important that, mm. you know, let's be honest, if you wind back and they've looked at it and we're going into League One, they want to get to Super League as quickly as they can. So mm. they've employed at the time probably the most successful coach in the champ outside of Super League, Paul Rowley. And they've brought in a lot of high, highly paid, you know, top end championship stroke Super League players because the vision was to go from naught to 60 mm. as quick as they could. So, you know, the, the, the models at New York and Ottawa may be different in that they, they want to develop, they want to take the time. They, they'll all have different business plans, different strategies, but Toronto's strategy was clear. We're coming in and we want to be in Super League. Well, and they've so done to it, do that, so. you've, you know, you, you're class of 92 at uh, Salford. They've not come in and said, well, let's, we'll, we'll buy the best of players in this division. Yeah. They're buying players from two mm. or three, four leagues above yeah, they are, because yeah. they, they want to get to where they want to be as quickly as they can and that was Toronto's objective. Well, but this is the, <clears throat> this is where we go back to the salary cap debate that we had before. <laughs> if there was no salary cap, then I know, I know people had said Toronto would buy well, that's the league, but that's, what, that's, that's, that's what Man City have done. Like, yeah. let, let's yeah, be honest, that's don't, what Man don't, City have done over the last got, years. I, I still don't think that... I still don't think there's cast iron proof that you can buy the league anyway. Because even without, even if you scrap the salary cap, I don't believe that you no, could just buy no. a load of players that still win. You look at Salford. Okay, yeah, it was in the salary cap. Salford have done far better since they've stopped spending all the money that, that QCash had. Because <clears> it's all about building the team. You look at the most successful teams have all been built around a core of homegrown players. I think that's where <clears> I believe they've got the right man in, in Brian McDermott at the, the helm. Because... He's very much, you know, he, he's worked on that, you know, he, that, that philosophy of giving younger players the opportunity. He does believe very much in, although, you know, he knows he's got to have the tools to do the job at Super League level. I think he does, he's open to, to progressing some Canadian players if he can do. Mm. I know that they're, they're looking to bring a, a Canadian boy back into the squad yeah. now. There's, some, there's, not, there's like visa and work permit issues, isn't there, I think, which yeah, is one of the issues. That nothing, it's my understanding, and I, I don't know uh, all the ins and outs and the intric intricacies of everything, but my understanding really is some of the rules and regulations are not helping them. And, no, no, no. And, and, and sort of the visa restrictions are not just working against some of the clubs who've got to go out there. It's an absolute farce. They're working fast, against but... them trying to get Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, lads yeah, over yeah, here yeah. to play as well. Well, yeah. it's, it's an absolute farce all that Canadian players are classed as. Yeah, but that, I don't even think that's. And yeah, yeah, you're right. What you're because saying, the they, RFL they, shouldn't count them on the court. But I, I still think there's issues that go beyond the RFL in terms of home office and visa requirements that's preventing getting Canadian players over. Because you can't. I think I've said this somewhere else. You can't just. You know, like obviously I've done a lot of work in basketball. You, just because you're an American basketball player doesn't mean that you can come over and play professional over here. You've got to have played to a certain level. You've got to have played so many percentage professional games and obviously these Canadians haven't got a platform to got achieve the, the criteria. Is the pedigree's yeah. not there to be able to, to take the boxes, is it? Um, the, the other Sky game on Friday is going to be is Salford against Huddersfield. No, ooh, tough one. Um, I've, I, I really hope they I, get... I, I like, Huddersfield performed very well against Castellans in the opening round. Obviously yeah. they didn't play against Leeds because it was postponed. But I, I do like Salford... Uh, under Ian Watson, so I'll, I'll tip Salford for that one. 50 50, that one really isn't You're going to draw a golden point, Andy. There you go, you can go for that if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll follow Drew on that one. I'm, I'm, I don't want to sit on the fence, so I'll, I'll go Salford because I just think that Ian Watson. I think he, he gets him out. Regardless out of the changes very in the squad, coach, he, he? he seems to, regardless of who comes in and out of that group, the group mentality stays the same, the ethics and the the work ethic of the, the whole team seems to, whether you've got Jackson Hastings or Kevin Browning, mm. they, they, they play very the same way and, and the structure I, of the goal. I, I, I mean, I must admit, I seen that on the fixture list and I thought, we've had these two weeks of Super League where massive occasion, great crowd, you know, looks great on TV and then you've got Salford, with all due respect to Salford and Huddersfield, you've got that. And obviously Salford have got a massive, I know I think they have 4,500 there, which is a good step up mm. against Toronto. That's a big challenge for Salford, isn't it? It's just trying to get them numbers. Anthony Crowell the numbers numbers well, the I, I'd like them to film from the other side at Salford. Yeah, 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 I yeah, think that'd right. make it look miles better. Even, even, without, even without any more numbers in the crowd, I think if you filmed from that small side and you were filming to the big stand, because obviously that Salford do generally get decent numbers. Yeah, it, 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 looks, looks, it look impressive. Yeah, it, it looks um, decent on telly when it's like a Wigan or a Leeds or a Saints yeah, going yeah. when they when they fill that opposite stand out, yeah. uh, and then there's only one empty stand. But obviously when it's a Huddersfield going, no disrespect to Huddersfield, they'll probably take 
a couple of hundred, one yeah. or two hundred maybe. Uh, so it won't look as full, and then you'll just have everyone tweeting about the the attendance that's all for Rab and Evel's doing a full length try or whatever. <laughs> just, um, I'd like to see them, them succeed over there. Ian Ian Blaze is work, working socks off and. Uh, and Watto's doing a great job. Well, they're going in the right direction, and that's yeah. all you can ask, isn't it, really? Yeah, I'd like and, and with the with the budget they have got, they, I think they, they always seem to recruit well, don't they, Salford? Uh, considering they've, pro- they've probably got the the least amount of money in, in Super League this year, um, and they always seem to recruit well. I, 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 I always, I'm always impressed with the squad. I think you find a good coach uh, who players want to play for, like Ian, obviously. You know, um, that's a massive tool in, in mm. recruiting players, because it's... Uh, the big sell, you know, is, is, is obviously players want to, you know, they, they want to earn money, but they want to be happy in the, yeah. in the day-to-day job, well, don't they? I've seen um, Kevin Brown was commentating at the Warrington game and I was just asking him how he's settling in and he, he says he loves it at Salford. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, I think if you speak to uh, all the players who've been in and out of Salford, yeah. they've all like really, you know, like even Jackson Hastings had always gone to Wigan, but I think, you know, he, the bit of him regrets leaving Salford. Josh Jones said the same when yeah. he'd signed for Hull. He, you know, he was good to be leaving. So a good indicator is always when your players who moved on they come back and support you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because you know that's a genuine. You'll always get the the parting speech of uh, I've enjoyed my time, etc. Proof in the pudding. If you see them sat in the stand mm. when they're not playing for the new club, it's always an indicator. Well, it was, <laughs> well, it was, it was, it was it Ian Bleasy's daughter was went out with Jackson Hastings uh, as a mascot, didn't yeah, they, on the for the that, first yeah. Wigan game? And it's like, well, well, I know Ian. I, I had a good relationship with Ian when I was over at Swinton and we met regular and. Uh, and and I know that he looked after Jackson, and I know yeah. I, th- I think in some of the stories he told me was he come home and Jackson was sat on couch watching <laughs> telly with his feet up, and so yeah, that but that again shows you what a friendly club they are, yeah. and, and CEOs going out of his way to make sure that lads are being looked What's after, and, and it's it's uh, there's a lot to be said for looking after people, and not just in sport but in in life generally. Um, Leeds Hull KR Friday night, that's a big one for Leeds. I think it's. A... <sighs> They're not must win games yet, but it's it's quite a big game this for Leeds, I think. Uh, they've got to lay down a marker um, <clears throat> sooner rather than later. But I've been impressed by OKR. I bet, I bet OKR are fancying that, uh, I think. Because they've got another, I think the thing with OKR is, because a bit like London last year, because everyone's wrote them off, yeah. they've yeah. not got anything yeah. to lose every yeah. week they go into a game. and um, no, no pressure, really, is there? I'll have to go Leeds. They've Good got, they've got, Leeds. they've got to lay down a marker, haven't they? Um, but then again, I wouldn't be surprised if all can turn them off, <laughs> and they probably will. They you know, at Leeds. <laughs> well, I can't keep agreeing with you. So I'll, I'll just go <laughs> you can hide behind trees, but no, I, I, I fancy all I think Leeds are um, in that situation uh, a little bit like United in, in the football now, where when you've had your glory years. Mm. And you drop off. It takes time to turn mm. that cycle around. And, and I think all, all the all the hope that there was a new era had just got completely extinguished by that first game. Isn't it? That's the worst thing that could have happened. From under them a little bit. Because even so. if they did, even if they did have lost by four or six points yeah. and showed a little bit of something, I think people would have been encouraged. But it's just the sheer <clears> fact that well, if there's they got if there's one coach in Super League who's going to go there with a game plan to 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 be able to. Uh, Upset the apple cart at Leeds, it'll be Tony Smith. And, and the circumstances surrounding obviously Mossy Missou, I think that gives all car that 10% extra. Galvanises uh, everybody, yeah. doesn't it? You know, they're all fighting for, for, mm. for um, them then, aren't they? Saturday is Catalan Casper Israel Flower being lined up for his first game. Oh, wow. Um, Catalan win Israel Flower man of the match. I wonder what odds we can get on that from Betfred. Is that sponsors <laughs> man of the match? Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go with. Catalan, I don't think I'll back against Catalan when they're playing at home too many times this year. Uh, so I'll go with the Dragons. I like what I saw of Cass last week against Toronto. Mm. I thought they were very dominant in the middle. Um, I, I think Cass could go there and get a result. I, I still think I, I think Cass are another of them teams there. No one talks about them again. Again, so, they can go under the radar a bit. Danny, no Danny Richardson and Jake Truman in the arms, that's mouth-watering, isn't it? It's but if you, if, per, that, isn't yeah. it? If you look at, if you look at, in like you were saying about um, Ian Watson and Salford, if, if you look at Cass over the last five, six years, no matter what players he's had, they've done well. And although people aren't talking about them, I still think... Well, obviously, I, have they still got... Oh, no, they'll have, they'll have some players back, won't they, from concussions uh, this week. Uh, but Pete Matoti is still banned. Uh, I think Greg Evening's touch and go, so... I'll go with the Dragons, but... Um, Hull Saints, be a good game, that one. Oh, and the World Cup Challenge is next week, isn't it? 
yeah. for Saints. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Hull for that one. I but agree. When was the last time Saints lost back to back? No, I, there's an argument to say they'll bounce back in the you know, but I think dependent on what bodies are available and what the intentions you know you you never want to look too far in front of you, but with a game like the World mm. Cup Challenge on the horizon, there mm. could be a and obviously and they've all, got they've got a lot of it. If you had someone in, who's fifty fifty, yeah, they're, they're, they're not, not going to play, play this week. No, yeah. no. So um, I, th- I don't think obviously Robbie and Coot they they still won't play. Making some won't play because they'll, they'll be wanting to get them back for the roots. Yeah, yeah. Fan, quite fancy all there. Uh, and I like Hull's pack. Hull's um, pack this year is sensational. Wakefield Warrington. Warrington. Can't look past Warrington mm. really at the moment. Tough, can you? tough one for Wakefield. I think Matty, might, Matty Ashton might get his first try on the board. Right? Is that what you're going for? Yeah, right. We'll, we'll, go the, we'll, go the, we'll go the bookies for that <laughs> one. Um, championship this week: Batley Swinton, Bradford Featherston, Halifax, Dewsbury, Lee York. Some good ones here. Bradford Featherston, Lee York. Will be good. Sheffield to lose. Witness London. Whitehaven Oldham actually to be fair it's having a scan through there some some really big games in the context of where teams are at because you know Batley and Swinton you'd expect both are going to be down there Swinton had a good win at Whitehaven yeah. um, Whitehaven and Oldham playing each other obviously both got promoted last season Widnes and London both you'd expect to be top uh, yeah, five I was disappointed for Stuart yesterday I keep in touch with Stuart Littler obviously and uh, I, I, I thought they beat Dewsbury yesterday I thought it was because they've they've had a good win at yeah, and they could have built a bit of momentum. They could have built some yeah. momentum on that, and I think had they won yesterday, then they'd be going in into mm. to Batley, you know, on form and with some momentum. So mm. I was gutted when I saw obviously it was off, off, it was yeah. off yesterday. Yeah, well, to be fair to Swinton, yeah. I mean, did did you was, were the fixtures out before you left? Oh no, you left before. No. I was going to say they they've landed on the feet with the fixtures. Yeah, Swinton, haven't really, they? White really Haven, Dewsbury, Batley, first three games. I mean, you'd never look forward to a game up in Whitehaven at, uh, <laughs> in February. February. But, but at the same time, when the fixtures are coming out, the team that, to get the team that's coming up, and in, in terms of budget, you know, knowing what they'll have distribution-wise, I know Swinton, with what we left there, they'll be on probably double in terms of distribution. Mm. So while it's not an easy game, don't get me wrong, it's probably, as, it could have, yeah, you'd be yeah. looking for Whitehaven and Oldham that first yeah. week, wouldn't you? And it's so important to get yeah. points on the board early doors. I think, I think it was Barrow, not last season, the season before, Barrow had a really good start to the season and it basically them, and that yeah. kept them yeah. up because they, they, they didn't do at all well the second half of the season but they'd already had so many points. I, I just remember them being on 15 in the table for, yeah. for what seemed like yeah. an eternity because they just got the points on the board and it meant they just weren't worrying. It's, it, Whereas know, when you're playing catch up, it's you're, a lot. You're better having them in the bag, aren't you? It's always the old adage that you know you'd rather have them in the bag than yeah. those games in hand uh, in football. You they know, you can't look at them and say that's no. three points. Yeah, and that's three yeah, points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, having the points. Yeah. There. I'm surprised Sheffield got a bit of a tonking at Lee on Saturday. I told you Lee are going up, James. Um, I think, I, think uh, it's, I really fancy Lee to to give. York York could be a, York could be a tough tough opponent. At the sports village, they will. Uh, there's a bit of a surprise package for me this year, York, because it, will it be second season syndrome or will they continue that good? <coughs> a bit uh, like we were saying before, everyone, before. everyone, no, everyone's got them, everyone's targeting them out there. Well, last season, no one was expecting no, them to do as but well. They, but they have recruited you well. You've got Chris Clarkson, Danny Washburn for this year, mm. two very experienced super James forwards. Green. James my, fear, Green. my fear for York was they, they, they'd got some uh, really good older heads in that side. Um, who's been with them over the last couple of years, Tim Spears and uh, the, the lad who's, uh, who was at Hull, Richard Arn's brother. Yeah, uh, Graham Arn. Yeah. And, and I felt that whether they could replace those guys as they do sort of come to the end, well, they have made some, some really mm-hmm. good signs. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, see how they go. Um, I, I don't think I tipped them to be in the top five this year. Uh, but I don't think they'll be they'll be near the bottom either. I think they'll I, just be I, I do like table, I do like the Luca Lee this year though. I'll be honest. I think uh, you look at the the recruitment. It's been really smart. I think he's mm. built. John's had the the ability to to build on a, a good season last yeah, year. I think I think the thing with Lee this year is they've got no out and out superstars. If that makes sense, yeah. but they've got a solid. They, he's, they've season. gone back to almost a bit to the formula that they did so well under Paul Rowe because I think that's where they got a little bit carried away, didn't they? Where they were actually doing well recruiting for championship and then obviously when they came out of Super League they just recruited you know Derek came out with his whole I've recruited a Super League squad for the championship and it just didn't it just didn't work because ultimately it's not Super League so you've got to get out of the division you're in there's some lads who, who've been around the block and I think when we touched on with, with York there that they, they know that division and they know how to get you know get those little 10% mm. here and there that, that matter in that division where some of the Super League guys 
there's absolutely no doubt they can be tremendous athletes mm. and they can you know they can they can tick all the boxes on the stats but when they go up to barrow on a on a, yeah. on a muddy, muddy field well, they're, it's a they're playing up the hill at back the hill <laughs> that's it it's a, it I, I, be, uh, I think Danny Addy is a tremendous signing for the Centurion they've got depth I, really I think that's the thing with Lee they've got depth haven't they I think that's well, another key part I think. you look at the key key positions at the half backs the four quality yeah, half backs yeah, yeah. there aren't they and then it's not bad when Martin Ridge your fourth choice half back <laughs> no <laughs> not um, so I mean we they've got the lad from uh, Hull Beaniak and and Cameron Scott, Cameron Scott. Yeah, we, I like we Cameron tried Scott. to get Beniak in at Swinton last year because Stuart coached him with the uh, the like island him. setup, and I tried really hard to to get him. Stuart wanted him, I worked hard to get him in. We just couldn't get him through the door, but he'll he'll go really well. He's, he's a powerful, big, strong athlete, and that's the kind of uh, player who he's coming to lead to to make his name yeah, still and, yeah, and, yeah. and put himself back in that Super League uh, shot window, isn't he? Like Liam Mudd as well. Uh, I think he's an unreal player in the championship. I'm, I'm well, I mean, they've got Wildy as well. Yeah, yeah. Know. Well, Hull's, Hull's been in the championship for a couple of years now. Obviously, he, was a, he had that little stint at witness, but he's been at Lee for a couple of years now. But I, I'm surprised that no Super League clubs have, have come in for, for I always much. try and gauge a, a, the strength of a, of a team on the players that are not playing at a given weekend. And if you look at the even the yeah. four sides at Lee who... You know, again, I refer back to, to to we had Liam at Swinton, and he's an out and out, you know, top end championship player. And he's not getting in the side there at Lee at the minute. Jared Summit, you know, he missed the Dewsbury game. Ryan Ince. Ryan Ince. Yeah. There's players of real quality who are not in the team at the moment. Which there's some good options there. <laughs> um, Duff's is a good coach. I, I do yeah. rate John as well. Yeah. Drew, it's that time of the week. Drew's thirteen questions. Brace yourself, Andy. Quick this fire for questions. You. Quick fire questions, questions for you. Uh, I haven't seen these this week, so these are a shock to me. <laughs> Favourite football team? I think we've touched Manchester United. Uh, first thing that comes to mind when you think of rugby league? Passion. Uh, who was your, your hero growing up in terms of RL? Timmy Street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's the one to watch at Rochdale this year? Uh, I think young Sam Freeman, who's coming from Widnes. I think he's, he looks exciting. A lot of good young players we've got. Came there, through as a as a winger at Witness, but he's got number one shirt. He did. He, he's he, Matt's give him the the, the full back uh, role uh, in pre season. He's looked sharp, and I think we can expect some big things from Sam this year. Yeah. Uh, fa- favorite uh, rugby league memory. I think uh, going back to two thousand and thirteen, and and when I was involved at Lee and and winning the the Northern Rail Cup, and being out on the pitch with the lads and and the directors and. Uh, that was a memory that always stands out. Really, is uh, when 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 you're you know it's your boyhood team and to be involved in winning at any kind of trophy. That that was a memory that will always stay with me. Yeah. Uh, your first game that you ever went to, can you remember? First or game. The first game you can remember. Yeah. I, well, I always remember um, my grandma knitting me a red and white jumper and, and being thrown over at turnstile at the old Elton Park. But uh, the actual game, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the one really change in rugby? <sighs> I'm not a big fan of this uh, this stop clock. Oh, I'm right. not a big fan of it. I don't. I don't particularly like it. Well, so you, you just go back I'll to pro- it. Well, scrap I'll possibly it. scrap that one. Yeah, I'd like. Uh, yeah, I'm not overly keen on it. Were you one of those you'd feign injury at a scrum just to waste a bit of time? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, I think we need you know, <laughs> some bigger blocks. They need. They need a bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite player at the Hornets? Uh, Penky. <laughs> no, he's a solid player, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he turns up every really. week. I, I don't know if he does it. He, he's, he's, he's about yeah. 45 now, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's the easiest club to deal with? That's a good question. Good question. I'd probably say York. York with John, John Flatman up there, who we've got very friendly with. and, and they're, they've we, We've had a couple of dealings over, we've drawn them in the cups and things, and really accommodating. We've worked well together, and uh, really well run club. Uh, what's your worst moments in your, your rugby career? Now this will be one that um, in 2015 I was helping out a friend of mine at Lee East and um, he got to a, a grand final, uh, Paul Wingfield. And he got to a grand final and a couple of weeks before we beat Underbank and we got we played them in the grand final and we uh, we failed to turn up and, and that would have been a catalyst I believe for that club to go back into NCL1 and maybe go back to Premier and, and f- fell at the final hurdle so... I was disappointed for, for, for Paul at that time because he put his heart and soul into it, yeah. Uh, you've mentioned it a few times today, but which team did you grow up supporting? In rugby terms, I'm a Lee lad and I, and I supported Lee, yeah. yeah. Favourite away ground? Away ground? Uh, oof, another good question. 
I always liked the old Norton Park at Widnes, so the old grounds I always enjoyed going to. Yeah. So, you, you know, your Weldon Roads at Castleford. We, we was at Castleford the yeah. other week and we went into the toilets, didn't we? It was just, <laughs> it was a complete yeah. experience. I like the old Knowsley Road, even yeah. uh, around the corner here, the old uh, Wilderspool yeah. Stadium. There's the no, old stadiums had the character, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. yeah. There, there's no smell like a, a toilet at, uh, at the jungle. <laughs> no. Uh, best game uh, that you've been to? Best game? Um, 1989, I think it was, Widnes and Canberra Raiders at Old Trafford. That was one of the... Because I think at that time, you, you, it wasn't obviously as, as televised as it is now and you didn't get to see some of the the world stars mm, up yeah, front yeah. That, that close. So to see Jonathan Davis, your Jonathan Davises of the world and your Martin Fires taking on your Laurie Dalys yeah. and some of those, you know, those Canberra Raiders players at the time, uh, you know, that was probably a memorable game in... in uh, Going obviously as a Leeds fan, um, one game that always stands out in my mind the '87 Challenge Cup final, when uh, we were an ankle tap away from Wembley against St Helens, and and that was the, the one if you could go back and and, and you had a time machine you could do it all again, and John Henderson's ankle didn't get tapped and we could have gone to Wembley. Yeah. <laughs> um, before before we let you go, Andy, we have to talk <coughs> about the 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 Manchester thing. Just just touch on it briefly. Yeah. Um, obviously. You made the decision that that's what you were going to do. Is was there any regrets over how that all panned out? <clears throat> I I think I'm a great believer in in you have to do what you think's right. Um, go down the route you believe is the best, and and not regret anything really. And and slight regret in that we could have probably with hindsight maybe handled it a bit better mm. than we did. But I believe it was for the you know the best intentions. It was the right move for that particular club. Um, knowing what we knew and what we know, um, I believe it was the right thing. So, never have any sleepless nights over it. And and we did reach a certain point where we, you know, it was do or or die as far as we were concerned. We just didn't, we couldn't justify carrying on investing in something and that we didn't really believe in. So we either had to go for it or leave leave it um, as we did. And you know, no, no regrets as such because I think that that club's in as good a health as it could be. Um, you know, we've left them with a good staff, a good coach, a good squad, you know, and, uh, and and if they do things the right way and carry on working hard, there's no reason why they, you know, they can't uh, have a good year this year. Uh, and a final point, you've seemed to have built this aura, really, from the Swinton days of obviously being, just running the club in, in the right way. What What's the secret, do you think, to, to, to that? Is it just the getting things done, the honesty, the transparency, or is there anything else? I think it's, it's uh, my belief is it's a team thing as well you can't you can't go in and, and, and want to control everything and be the the main man you've got to build a team and what we did successfully at Swinton is we brought people so initially I, I took the club on but we brought we built a board and we did things you know you've got to sometimes take the emotion of sport away and apply what you do on your day-to-day business on a daily basis and we always talk about sustainability that was always the key word at, at Swinton and at, and at Rochdale it'll certainly be the same because We'll build it as a business. It won't be reliant upon uh, any one individual. It's a team ethos. And, you know, you've got to, for me, it's embracing volunteers, embracing people who, who want to work hard and, and getting the right sort of uh, ethos in at the top because everything's driven, you know, f- from, the, from the top. And if you, you're not setting the right examples and you're not doing things right at the top, then everybody just follows suit, don't they? And, and what made you get back into the game then with Rochdale? I think that... <clears throat> no intention of coming back into it so quickly really I think there was two things one obviously we built a really close tight knit board there at Swinton so we all carried on socialising together and, uh, and and watching games we went to the grand final together and we got a t- you know you know Richard and, yeah. and, and a couple of other guys there his dad's there. not speaking to him I think cause well he's, he's an older he's, old him, yeah, he's an yeah. older lad yeah so he's uh, he's, he's tread over to the dark side <laughs> but, but yeah I think the, the, the key for me is that was having a, a unit there a ready made sort of board to plug in to the right club at the right time with the right opportunity and it's, we sort of fell on Rochdale really because I, I, knew, I knew their chief exec Steve from uh, who's now our chief exec Steve from, from my time at Swinton and we were having a conversation really and just, just staying in touch and it was a case of, do you fancy coming over here? I said, absolutely not. I'm not jumping out of any frying pans into a fire. <laughs> but when, when I started, he, he, he explained a little bit about the club and the opportunities that come with it and, and all the things that we spoke about. And, and I went away to the lads and I, and I rang Rick up and Peter and, and Tony and I said, listen, 
chaps, you're going to think I'm bonkers here, but just, just bear with me. And as I started telling them, they were like, mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we felt there's a good opportunity there um, because of the, the existing board have, have really backed us and, and, and they've sort of opened their arms to us and said it's the right time for this club to, to do what, what you're proposing to do. All the volunteers and fans, the vote was unanimous. There wasn't one single vote against us. So you feel like you're pushing an open door and you don't feel like there's any... You feel like you're on the back, you were at Swinton, obviously a lot of people were against... They didn't the, want to the, go the way we the, wanted to go, to be fair, which, you know, it's understandable. Mm. I can completely appreciate why you wouldn't. Um, the only bit that disappointed me there was I think we proved over the, the two years that we had the best interests of the club at heart and we were doing things the right way. And if we, as professionals and people who knew what was going on, and we're privy to, to what's going on behind the scenes in the sport to some degree. If we felt that was the right way, I, I just hope, I, I did hope that you know the, the, the backing would come because we, we'd proved ourselves to be mm. in it for the right reasons type of thing. But you know it's all gravy now that one I suppose, and uh, all the emphasis really is all on what we're doing at Rochdale and everybody. It, it's exciting times for them because there's um, there's an argument to be had when you, when you do start at the bottom, then there is only one way to go, mm. isn't there? Yeah. So, Andy, cool. thanks very much for coming in. Drew, thanks for coming to work. Pleasure, thank you. All <laughs> the best uh, to Rochdale <laughs> for the upcoming season. Hope you get the Challenge Cup and all that sorted. Uh, thanks for tuning in again. We're now back as an audio podcast as well on iTunes, Spotify, Audio Boom, all those places you're going to get. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and don't forget to keep it at loverubbyleague.com through the week and we'll see you next time.